great staff here. <laughs> Debbie, the one-armed bandit. I told her, I told her, she, I mean, she gets so cocky. And she said that she could take Brian and arm wrestle. I said, you can't. And she lost. She lost. Oh, so good to be with you today. And you know, some things are inevitable. That's just the way it is. Some things in life are just inevitable. When I was about eight years of age, I was playing baseball, and the batter, he hits a strong line drive. And I went to catch it, but instead of catching it with my glove, I caught it with my nose. <laughs> Broke it. Twice, twice in my illustrious wrestling career, I broke my nose. When I was a youth pastor, I was playing football with the guys, and we were out there, and I remember I was overpassed, and I turned, boom, just crushed into the defender and broke my nose. I've never had it repaired. And if you look at me closely, you'll see that my nose takes a right turn. It goes out there and... Because when you have a honker on your face this size, <laughs> some things are inevitable. It's going to get broken. That's just the way it is. You head out on a trip, and if you're going any distance at all, if you don't fill your tank, you're going to be stranded alongside the road. It's just inevitable. You go to the grocery store, you fill your cart with groceries, you get in line, you, know, you wait three, four months, you get up there, you go for your wallet and you don't have it. Who's been in that boat? Thank you. I was just that way a giant eagle here. But be I caught on before I got in line. So I went and I parked my cart and I drove home, got my wallet, went back, and, oh look, there's a cart full of groceries. I'll take them. <laughs> got in line. It's just that way. You know, you can't go anywhere, do anything on empty. You gotta have something. 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> it was inevitable. You had so many people that were against Jesus, screaming, crucify him. They didn't like him. And so, after a trial and false witnesses and all that, it was inevitable that he was gonna be crucified. What they didn't know, that it was inevitable that he would rise again. And all of a sudden, they started to see empty in a different light. Now here we are, we carry on the theme that we started last week. But truthfully, is not what we do every week? This is Resurrection Sunday. Next week will be Resurrection Sunday. We don't celebrate Shabbat or the Sabbath on Saturday. The church started celebrating on Sunday because we recognize that Jesus Christ left the tomb empty. But he left the tomb empty so that we could live our lives full. The tragedy is many aren't. So I'm talking a little bit about that this morning. Let's look at our scripture in John chapter 20. <clears throat> on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Pray with me. Father, most of us here probably know, at least intellectually, that you give life. And that we're not meant to run on empty, but the fact that you left the tomb empty means we can run full. I pray, Lord, that you would turn the light bulbs on in our minds this morning. Give us a fresh understanding and give us a boldness to live life as you intend. We give you the praise.
pray is in Christ's name. Amen. Let's talk about some things that come out of the fact that we can live life to the full. What happened when he left that tomb empty? First of all, he gives us this peace to his last name. Now, um, that's not like it's some new insight to us. We always talk about the fact that God gives peace. Think about this scenario here. The scripture says they, these disciples are in a locked room, locked the door. They're scared to death. I mean, they saw what happened to Jesus. And keep in mind, they all bailed except for John. None of them were there to support him. And they're thinking the same thing that happened to him could easily happen to us. They, they watched the week unfold. They watched Jesus Christ come into Jerusalem as a hero, having a big parade. They watched him mix all week with people and teach. They shared a nice meal with him, but then they also watched Judas betray him. They watched false witnesses get up and lie about him. They watched him getting beaten, mocked, and crucified. But then, as we talked last week, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Salome, they come, and boom, the tomb is empty. Peter and John come and confirm it. Now, what do they do with this? This doesn't all make sense. And so they're hiding in this room, not sure what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and he gives a traditional Jewish greeting. Shalom. I go to Israel today, it's going to be the same. Shalom. If I'm saying goodbye, shalom, shalom. Peace be with you. This is important. Because you see, what happened was Jesus took an ordinary greeting and transformed it into an uncommon assurance. Instead of you guys having to cower in fear, I'm saying, peace be with you. And there's also a part of me that wonders, did any of them think, you remember back when you were in school and how saintly you were? <laughs> Yeah, you laughed because you know that you weren't. And when the teacher left the room, chaos broke out. You did whatever you wanted, and then all of a sudden the teacher walks back in the room. Whoops! Think about this. Again, the disciples had abandoned Jesus. They abandoned him, except for John. And all of a sudden, the teacher shows up back in the room. I wonder if any of them thought, are we in trouble? Are we toast? What's going to happen now? And Jesus says, Pete, be with you. <coughs> what a terrific, what a terrific assurance. I have to tell you, <coughs> I keep calling it a commodity. It's not a commodity. I'm not sure what to call it. But peace is something I value beyond words. And I live in peace. And I'm going to tell you, I can think of a bazillion reasons in my life that I shouldn't have peace. Of the junk I've done and how I have hurt the Lord. But he said, Tom, I forgive you. Peace be with you. I love peace. I savor peace. Now what's interesting is how he, when he presents peace, the backdrop that he gives to it. He says, peace be with you. And then the scripture says, he shows them his scars. Now, you know, have you ever gone online and you, you want something to kind of give you peace and you have the soothing music and nice pictures, tranquil pictures? How many of you go on lines to, online or on the internet to kind of have something peaceful and look at scars? What's this about? It doesn't bring me peace. My body's covered in scars. 
I've got this huge scar right here on my shoulder where I had shoulder surgery. And it went south. It was bad. It was ugly. Anyway, it left me with this massive scar. And I remember, this is back in the 80s, I remember I was looking in the mirror one day, big old scar, and I remember thinking, I will never look the same again. Any, any of you think that in the way about yourselves, if you look at your scar? You just think, you are just one weird duck, aren't you? Never look the same. I don't look at scars as a sign of peace. And here Jesus says, peace be with you. Take a look at my scars. <coughs> you know why? Because peace is not built on our circumstances. Peace has nothing to do with the fact that he had been beaten. In fact, he carried peace through the beatings. He carried peace through the mocking. He carried peace through the crucifixion into the resurrection because he is the prince of what? Peace. And Jesus gives us peace. And he says it's not just peace when everything is sweet. It's peace in the battle. And you don't have enough scars to eliminate the peace that I want to give you. Not all of our scars are physical. You know what it's like to carry emotional scars. You know what it's like to carry pain that you think you can never get past. And Jesus says, yes, you can. In your deepest hurt, in your deepest pain, in your biggest struggle, my peace is still real. It's still there. It's still available. Peace. I remember, uh, I think it's been about 12 years ago now. And Queenie, Queenie had uh, routine surgery that we thought was routine, way routine. And I, I, the day of her dismissal, I went home to fix her some jello so she would something, have something to eat when she got home. Jello. There's always room for jello, no matter what happens. I <laughs> went home to fix jello, and Queenie called, and uh, she said, Hey, the doctor just came in. Right. How come get you? She pauses and she said, I have cancer. Hey, this, this isn't what I was anticipating hearing. You know, just come get me. Don't tell me you've got cancer. And thus began the journey. And, uh, you know, went through all that radiation, all that stuff. But here's, here's, what, here's what I remember. In the midst of all of that, God gave us this amazing peace. Now listen, I've spent my whole ministry talking about peace. I heard my dad, I heard all kinds of pastors talking about peace. I believe in peace, but I'm telling you, I experienced it like I have never experienced it. And then it was all the cancer was going away, we were fine, and of course, as you know, it's now back. But the peace never left. Listen, peace is not defined by circumstances. Peace is defined by a certain future. Now, when I say that, I told you before, I have no idea when you'll be healed. I don't know. We don't know. But our future is still secure. Do you understand? So we have peace. And I know that it's only a peace that God can give, and we rest in that peace. We savor that peace. Sometimes I think we, we make the mistake of feeling as if we are just ordinary people. And as ordinary people, we're just going to have to struggle through these battles, and we may not always have peace. Listen to me. There is nothing ordinary about you. Nothing. Do you think if somebody could create another human being like you, would you call their creation ordinary? No, you wouldn't. You can cut me, and this body will heal itself. 
You think that's ordinary? This last week, Quinny and I sat down with a bunch of doctors at Simon Cancer Center, IU Med Center, for genomics, genetic work as they begin to dig into her DNA. The cancer that Queenie has, I don't know if I told you, is very rare. About one or two people out of a million who get cancer ever get this. So there's not much known about it. So they're going to dig into her DNA. They said, you know, you've got 10 trillion cells in your body. Said, How do you know? Did you count? What? Where'd you get the time to do that? You know, I'm talking about the DNA and all this, and I think to myself, wow, the scripture says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is nothing ordinary about us. Nothing. You have never met an ordinary person. What is ordinary? That in itself should give you a sense of peace that you are extraordinary. You are uniquely created by God himself, and he went and died for you and said, I am with you. I will never forsake you. I am on your team. And I will give you a peace that is lasting. You rest in me, and you can rest in peace. Well, then he goes on, and he says, not only this peace that's lasting, but he says, I'm going to give you a purpose that will really satisfy you. Now, again, I'm trying to put myself in the disciples' shoes. And he says to them, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. If I'm one of those disciples right then, I'm saying, time out. We saw what happened to you. And it wasn't pretty. So when you stand here before me and say, hey, guess what, guys? As a father sent me, boom, I'm sending you out the same way. Have fun. Remember a few Sundays ago, we talked about the fact that there is a cost to serving Christ. There is a cost. And sometimes we think, you know, those original disciples, John, as far as we know, was the only one that was not martyred. All the rest of them were martyred, killed, because of their walk with Christ. And we say, well, Lord, I'll be a disciple, but don't make me like one of those kind of disciples. I'll just be the guy in the background, you know, I'll take notes or something. Hey, do you think that Jesus died on the cross so we would come and take up space in a pew? You think he died on the cross so we could sit and say amen here and there? Or dress up and look good? I dressed up. I dressed up two weeks in a row just to let you know it could happen. Don't think it'll continue. You've seen it now. Jesus died to transform our lives and give us purpose. A mission. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all called into what we would call full-time Christian service in terms of a profession. Like you should be a pastor or missionary or something like that. But I don't care what your vocation is, we are called to a mission and a purpose. Now, I gotta tell you, but I, you would think that I would know better, but I'm just telling you, I don't know why I tell you all my weaknesses, but it's because I can stay here for years and still keep telling you. I've got that many. It was only about uh, six or seven years ago, and I went through a very traumatic time in my life. And I had to figure out, who is Tom Canan aside from being a pastor? Who am I really? <coughs> because, you know, it's easy to be defined by your profession, or easy to be defined by what you do. Who is Tom Kinnan? Why do I do what I do? Do I, do I go to church on Sunday? Because I have to? Do I preach a sermon or teach? Because that's expected in my job? 
Why do I do what I do? Do you think I want to come to church every Sunday? No, I don't. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> hey, I get up at 4 in the morning. I'm usually here 5 or a little after. The only person here is Terry because he's nuts. <laughs> he does that every day. You need to pray for him. <laughs> and I don't always feel like getting up. You know? You're the same way. And so some days, you don't. You just lay in bed. And then, you know, if I see you the next week, well, I'm sorry I wasn't here, you know, I wasn't feeling good last week. You know, I was able to go out and take off that afternoon. I felt a lot better. <laughs> the morning was really bad. You know what drives me? It's not how I feel at any given moment. It's my mission. It's my purpose. And my purpose, in regards to what your vocation is, our purpose is to worship the Lord and to put Him out before people. That's our mission. I don't care who you are, what you do, that is our mission. And that mission is accomplished not simply by a job. How I respond to people in any circumstance is a part of my mission. And if people come at me with disdain or hate or bitter words or whatever, how I respond now is going to be consistent or better be consistent with my mission, and that is to put Christ before them. I better respond in a loving, Christ-like manner. I need to see the Lord in every... I was in... I was in... Uh, I was right in right down the street over here. I think it all turned around here. That way, I think. So I walk in, I'm looking, I'm looking, I can't find what I want. And I see a lady over here in a wheelchair. But she's got the right aid tag on, you know. I said to her, hey, I'm looking for her. She said, oh yeah, I know where it is. And she stood up and started walking over. <laughs> I said, did I just witness a miracle? <laughs> Oh, she said, no, I was just warming the seat. <laughs> but you know what? i got to tell you, before I said that I just witnessed a miracle, there was a part of me said, don't say that to her. She'll think you're religious. Do you know what I'm saying? Anytime you want to put something out that might honor the Lord, say it more Stop it. But that's our mission. Put it out there. I told her, I said, I wish I had just seen a miracle. I could do it. What is your purpose? What is your purpose? How, how is it visible? Do people see what's happening? I read this story. Uh, a Scotsman came over to demonstrate the game of golf to President Ulysses S. Grant. So, he tees up the ball. It's all lined up. and He takes this mighty swing, digs up the turf, and the ball's still sitting on the tee. Grant's watching. He swings six times. The ball never moves. Finally, Grant says, he says, well, it seems like there's a lot of exercise with this game, but I fail to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> you know, a lot of us are out there swinging hard, but we fail to see our purpose. We fail to realize why we're swinging, or at what we're swinging. It's not complicated. Our mission, our purpose is to present Christ, to lift him up. Our words, our actions, everything we do, regardless of vocation, we lift him up before people. That's my mission. 
And I don't want to lose sight of it. And I'm telling you, I can lose sight of my mission just doing my job. That's why I told you, I don't preach sermons. I'm going to give you a message. Anybody can preach a sermon. But I better be listening to God because I have a mission. And I better be telling you what he's telling me. Because I have a mission. Do you understand the difference? That's why you and I need to be in tune with the Lord. So when we're talking to people, we're not just throwing words out or stuff we heard. We talk to God. I open his word and I hear from him. We have a mission. Sometimes we think that because we don't see it accomplished in the manner in which we want to see it accomplished, that somehow we've missed the boat. Hey, I've lost, uh, you know, a lot of skirmishes. And I've had a lot of dreams. I tend to be a dreamer. And I remember back in the 80s, uh, I really felt like God gave me a dream and a mission on a in a particular avenue to reach out and begin to help pastors who were struggling. Because there's a lot of unique stresses and strains that go with pastoring. And uh, <clears throat> so I began planning, and we were planning this conference called Still Waters for pastors and addressing some of the issues, and we worked hard on this. Spent a lot of money on it. About two weeks before the conference was to occur, I canceled it. Because I didn't think that the three registrations that we had were going to carry the day. I'm talking about a total bomb. Bomb. Failure. I said, Lord, what? what's the deal here? You know, I thought I heard from you. I did my best, and we just totally... <coughs> well, <clears throat> fast forward now, about probably 10, maybe 10 to 12 years past that point. And I was at Southern Western University. And uh, again, felt this need to help pastors. I was working with them quite a bit at that point. So we started, guess what? We started Still Waters. And it flourished. And God gave us a lodge called Eagle's Rest. We helped hundreds of pastors and families through all kinds of crises and needs. Um, I think, okay, so a part of that dream here was a total bomb failure. Over here was a great success. What was the difference? I think one thing, and, and every, every situation is different, so I'm, I'm just telling you in my situation. One of the things that God has to do before he can bring the mission into a success point for us is we've got to be emptied of ourselves. And while I saw God's mission over here, I thought I could pull it off. And I clearly couldn't. When we do God's work, please don't ever try to do it on your own. Please don't. God has his timing. He has it worked out. Don't think that the dream you have is something you need to put aside. God has a time. Make sure that he's the one who's making it happen. And he will make it happen. With that, there is something that ties us together. He talks about the fact that we have this peace that won't go away. We can have this purpose that will bring us satisfaction, a sense of fullness to us. But it's because there is a presence that's transforming. He looked at his disciples and he said, the scripture says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, it brings back to my mind. Remember we talked about a few weeks ago when God himself kind of leans over that bunch of dirt and he goes, 
and he breathes into it and humanity is born. Adam comes to life. He needed to remind these guys that life was still available. And he breathed life into them. He breathed the spirit into them. One of the things that humbles me, I think maybe I've told you, I don't, I don't remember, before God ever committed to recreate us through Jesus Christ, or before he committed to create us, he had first committed to recreate us through Jesus Christ. The scripture says in Revelation, it talks about the land that was slain before the foundations of the earth. So before he ever breathed life into Adam, he had already committed to go to the cross for us. That's mind-blowing to me. Why would he do that? Those of you that are parents, have you ever felt like you were a failure? I've never met any parent that hasn't felt like that at some point or another. And yet we keep having kids. <laughs> you see the other people's kids that are bad because ours aren't. <laughs> you see these other kids that are bad and you say, let's have kids. <laughs> You're single and you see all these divorces and you say to the one you love, let's get married. Be a nuts. You understand love. And you understand why Jesus, why God would say, I'll go to the cross even before he breathed life into Adam. Because love compels us. Does love compel us to engage in our purpose? To put life before people? To let them know about the presence of God himself who will breathe into us the Holy Spirit so that we can be full. Have you ever, you know when Thanksgiving comes around, <coughs> I enjoy a good Thanksgiving dinner. And I have eaten Thanksgiving dinners to the point that I am so miserable. I just, I mean, I don't, I don't want to leave the table because I can't. <laughs> I just, I mean, I'm miserable. I am, we say, well, I'm full. Well, any, any dessert? What do you got? <laughs> you gotta check it out before you say no. Oh, it's just cream pie. I don't have some. We're full. You know what it's like to be full? Sometimes we're full of pain. Sometimes we're full of dreams. Sometimes we're full of ourselves. Sometimes we're just full of belonging. But God says, I want you to be full of me. Because when you're full, it overflows. It just begins to spill out. Would you agree? It spills out. That's what I want. I want them spilling out. That's why the grave's empty. Life spilled out. Couldn't be contained. And he rose again. Jesus Christ himself left the grave empty so that we can live life full. The question is, are we? Are we? Are we living in his peace? Are we satisfied in that we know we are living his purpose? Are we aware of his presence? Is the fullness of the Spirit 